you know we're doing this little cheeky names of God series, and uh, last week I kicked it off, and I'm conti- I, and I talked about uh, uh, God as Adonai, and then this week something appeared on the screen. Look at that! That's who did that. Did we nick that off someone? It's quite good, isn't it? Hmm? Did he? Wow! Didn't know he could do that. Um, it might have been who? Oh, Gaz. Okay, Gaz in Australia did it. That's more likely. Okay, so, um, to be honest. Okay, so, none of us on the eldership purport to be graphic designers. Um, so, this week, we're going to do Jehovah Jireh. You all heard of that name before? Jehovah Jireh, or they would have said Yahweh Yireh, or something like that in the, in the days of the Hebrews. And it has an amazing background, so I'm going to start by reading you an account from the Bible which many people struggle with, but it's where this name originates from. And then I'm not going to talk for a whole load of time because I just want us to think on these things, and there are some cupcakes waiting for us. So this is Genesis chapter 22, and very weird story. A lot of people struggle with this one, and I'm going to try and unpack it a bit. And this is a story of Abraham being tested. Abraham, a phenomenal character in the Old Testament, in the lineage of Jesus, one of the father figures of our faith. And this is, this is a story of one significant account in his life. Chapter 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Now, we go straight on to verse 3 of what happens the next morning, which we'll read in a bit. We're not told how he felt that night, the struggle he would have gone through, the grief, the questions. This is a man being told by God to kill his son. Many people, understandably, struggle with this story. It's a tough one. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servant, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there and we will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Because back in those times, they would sacrifice animals, which we'll come on to briefly in a bit. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. And when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. And Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, Jehovah Jireh. And to this day it is said, On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you 
and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you've obeyed me. And Abraham returned to his servants and they set off together for Beersheba and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Wow. It's a bit of a story, isn't it? And some of you might not have read that story before or heard of that story. And it raises all kinds of questions. Well, let me just say this. There are profound echoes of the future in that story which are absolutely mind-boggling. And I, I got over 40 similarities in that story myself to what happened 2000 and about 2,091 years later. Let me read out about 21 of them or so. The father leads his son to be sacrificed. A donkey is involved on the road to the sacrifice. Both Jesus and Isaac are the one and only son. Did you notice how many times that was mentioned in the story? The son is a descendant of Abraham, as is Jesus. The sacrifices take place within a view of the same mountain called Mount Moriah in the Old Testament or Calvary in the New Testament. Even the son carries the wood to his place of sacrifice. Jesus carried his cross. The son was submissive to the will of his father. The father was willing to sacrifice his son if necessary. The father believed in both cases in the resurrection. Did you notice that little phrase in there, and we will come back? Did you notice that? He's taken his son to be killed, and he said, we will come back. He's not lying. He believed that God had the power to sort this thing out. Trusted God so much, trusted God with the life of his son. We will come back. The resurrection was prof- prophesied. The son was laid upon wood. The Lord himself provided the sacrifice. In this case, it was a ram, but it was a foreshadowing of Jesus. And blood was shed. And the sacrifice was a substitute, a ram, a substitute for Isaac. Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, a substitute for you. And people say, why on earth? Why on earth? What is this story about? I mean, is God a maniac? Is he some weird psychopath who's... You know, putting this man, Abraham, for absolute hell. No, no, I think this is remarkable. Thousands of years, over 2,000 years before Jesus Christ walked on the planet, Abraham was playing that story out prophetically, actually. It's quite remarkable. He was showing Abraham his lineage. And, but do you know what? I, I, we, we, we talk about God as if he's some disembodied, absent school governor or head teacher, or some uninvolved being, some divine gas floating around in the sky that has no feeling. I think God looked at Isaac being led to a place of sacrifice, and already, because he's outside of time, he's feeling the pain of the loss of his son right there and then. Because he knows that 2,000 years later, Jesus is going to die. And all the way through, he's watching it. He's feeling it. For God, it's a bit, bit, you know, it's a bit Star Trek. This, but I think time is outside of God. You know, He experiences tomorrow already. He's been there. You know, He's outside of all of this. So He's playing this out, and He's feeling it. And then when He provides the sacrifice, the ram, and He says, "Don't, don't touch your boy. Don't, don't touch your boy. Have the sacrifice." He knows at that point that He won't be able to do that. He knows he can't do it. He's going to have to send his only son, Jesus Christ. Now, (laughs) we might struggle with this story, but I have to say that when you read this account, and this is where you first see Jehovah Jireh, and we talk about God will provide, can I just say, this is not about getting a Porsche 911, or a white Mercedes, or a holiday in the Caribbean. When we talk about Jehovah Jireh, so many preachers will talk about physical, material provision. It was actually, it was never about that. It was actually about the ultimate provision, which is Jesus Christ. And 
I have to say, I really believe this with all of my heart, that actually only Jesus Christ can satisfy any longing, desire, or hole in our lives and hearts. You can do things like get married to a beautiful woman, have wonderful children. You could play the lottery with the hope that you might win. You might, you know, put some savings away, have a, f- have a final salary company pension scheme, a fire blade. All these things that we might really want in our lives. But let me tell you something. There's this weird thing that happens. The more you get, the more you want. It's so frustrating. I've got a cure for coveting. You know when you're coveting the desire that overwhelms you for something that someone else has? Like, you know, someone's got an MG midget you really want or something like that. I've got the cure for coveting. A temporary cure. Buy it. And then you don't covet it anymore because you got it. That's a joke, just in case you're wondering. Because it doesn't work. The more you get, the more you want. It's the law of diminishing returns. We accumulate stuff, and it doesn't somehow satisfy. I really believe with all of my heart that only Jesus Christ can truly satisfy. So I'm not saying that because I'm a paid professional, because I ain't a paid professional here. I just really believe it. And I've been preaching it since I was 18 years old. And I have to say, there was a moment, I was just thinking back when I was sitting on my sofa. I can remember a moment, because I think I'm this weird extreme personally between, I can be quite extrovert and then weirdly introvert and melancholic. Then I go away and paint and listen to classical music. <laughs> and I think and strange things overcome me. <laughs> but, and I, but I can have this melancholic thing that just sort of sweeps over me. And... Uh, and I remember once, before I knew Jesus, sitting in my mum and dad used to have my granddad's big swivel chair. It was like Captain Kirk's chair. I used to love it. And I used to sit in his swivel chair and listen to music. I remember once, waves after wave of sort of melancholy emotion was sweeping over me. And I sort of had this feeling like of, of homesickness, even though I was at home, or like something was missing. Have you ever had that? Have you ever experienced that? This kind of, I'm not all trying to lead you into manic depression. Or sadness at church. I'm here to fill you with joy. But have you ever had it? That sort of, if you haven't, just put your hands up and I feel terrible. But, you know, something missing. I used to get that feeling every now and again. I mean, tell anyone about it. Someone would think you're weird growing up in Romford. Judea Park and Romford Rugby Club. How are you doing, Beachy? Bit melancholic this week. I've been listening to Beethoven. <laughs> you know, in my granddad's chair. It wouldn't have gone down very well. Anyway. But when I met the Lord, it went. I've never had that again. I mean, I've had other weird things, but not that weird thing. Because I truly believe that only Jesus Christ can satisfy. I I believe it. I think only he can deal with longing and this sense of something missing. I, I, I believe it with all my heart. If you don't know what that feels like, I'd love to talk to you about it. I, but I, I think it's why we see visitors to the church. It's why I, I end up talking with a lot of people about these things. It's why most weeks I have a conversation with someone about these things who doesn't know the Lord. From all sorts of people, from ex-villains to business people to all sorts. There's something going on, something missing. Well, I believe only Jesus can satisfy that. And that's why we do things like the Alpha Course and stuff like that to help people navigate it. And that's why when we baptise people, sometimes you see people's faces glowing when they come out of the water. Because it does. Why would someone glow coming out of the water in a dodgy hot tub full of floating daddy long legs? I don't know. Honestly, that's what it's like. It's all part of the process. Why? Why? Why would that work? It's because it's new life and new hope, and it's. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit making a remarkable difference in people's lives. And, you know, we have ups and downs and pain and stuff, but that deep, that deep longing that is only satisfied by Christ, I believe. Now, a quick note on sacrifice. I think a lot of people struggle with this whole notion. Some people will be reading this and thinking, but why did God need to kill Jesus? And why did he need to slay a ram? And what's all that about actually it's a bit weird and i think it's very hard in 21st century uk to get the concept of sacrifice in our 
understanding in our hearts and heads. Now, obviously, back in the ancient Middle East, they were used to sacrificing. They would spill blood to cover sin, to, to make up for bad things that people had done. The whole idea being, you know, I've done bad things, I deserve punishment, so I'll kill a ram instead in a simplistic way, or I'll kill a dove or guinea pig or something. No, it wasn't guinea pigs. It's a joke. It would be doves and lambs and stuff. And uh, they would think that that would be a temporary satisfaction for God. And then you'd have to do it again and do it again and do it again and do it again. People don't quite understand why God would demand that. Well, let me put it this way. I think hardwired into us, all of us, I think it's God's hardwiring, is a sense of justice. Unless you've gone a bit, you know, psychopathic and you've got no sense of right or wrong, that's numbed in you, most of us have an instinctive sense of the need for justice. Agree? We get wound up about rightness and wrongness of things. Some people to a greater degree than others. Some people like Mr. Angry Neighbour, you know, wound up about everything in the universe. Other people get wound up about cosmic scale things or injustices around poverty or the refugee crisis. And, and you can feel this sense of injustice about the poor or you can have injustice about the amount of tax you're paying. And, you know, it's just in us. It's funny, I've thought, how we all want justice for all these other things. Like when Myra Hindley, the um, child killer, died, hundreds of people were outside the prison carrying placards years ago saying, Myra Hindley, burn in hell, justice is done. Funny how everyone starts to believe in hell for Myra Hindley. All want justice. We all want justice for everything but us. We don't want justice for ourselves. Have you noticed that? Like, because I don't know about you, but my middle name is Mr. Right. And I'm rarely wrong. I've often thought that everyone is weird apart from me. Have you ever noticed that? Like, because we've all got these massive blind spots, haven't we? But I think 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm pretty cool and I get everything right. And then Karen reminds me on a daily basis that that's actually quite wrong. I disagree with her quite passionately about these things, but I've probably got blind spots, and so have all of you. We all think we're perfect, to a greater or lesser degree, or we're right about things. We don't see our own blind spots. We also don't see the injustice of our own lives. This is a very hard concept to understand. But compared to the cosmic holiness, wonder, and perfection of the Lord, we're a bit of a stain, actually. It's a very hard concept to understand when you think that you're right all the time. So actually, God in his mercy looks upon us and sees a mess, but loves us so much, he sends his son. That is the ultimate provision in the universe. You might not think you need a saviour, but God knows you need a saviour, so he sent his son to die. And there was no pulling back on that one. He couldn't send a replacement. So thinking about God watching this Abraham scene play out for me is just utterly remarkable. The Bible tells us that we deserve hell, but God gives us heaven, gives us glory, gives us rescue, gives us salvation, and actually life to the full now. What a remarkable thing that is. When we take communion, it can almost become a bit of a ritual, but actually we're remembering that a man went to a lump of wood, got nailed to it and died. And when he died, the Bible tells us he actually had you in his heart. He was dying for you. The Bible does tell us. Really, in a sense, our theology is, if there's only one person he rescued, he still would have gone to the cross. Such did he love you. Even while he was dying, he rescued a couple of villains to the left and right of him if he could such as his passion and love for people. This rescue all the way through. So when we talk about provision, Jehovah Jireh, actually we're talking about God's provision of Jesus Christ. And this church is all about letting people know about him. He's the most remarkable, outstanding, incredible leader the world has ever seen. He wasn't just the most remarkable, outstanding, incredible leader and teacher. He was also the son of God. And he's the one to whom every knee will bow, whether we believe in him or not. 
I just think that is a thing that's going to happen. So here's a few pointers living in response to this amazing provision of Jesus Christ for us. Because we also know that he gives us life to the full, the Bible says. And Philippians 4.19 does actually say, following on from this, that my God, our God, will supply all our needs according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So how do we live in response to knowing that God is ultimately our provider? He saves us, he makes us holy, he cleans us up, he satisfies the longings in our heart, he can give us peace when we don't feel like we're very peaceful, he can give us joy, not a weird joy where we're going around smiling weirdly like a weird person. (laughs) I mean like deep joy, deep-seated joy that transcends all pain and heartache that we're going for, the joy that just keeps bubbling up from somewhere. How do we live? Well, I just thought a few practical pointers, really. I think it means that we live a very thankful life. I think followers of Jesus, followers of the way, because of this, should live as far as possible a very thankful life in all things. Now I know that we can get chipped up by stuff and annoyed and frustrated and angry, you know, standing in a queue for too long or family members do something weird and it hurts you and all this kind of thing, you know, and the bank, you know, charges you inappropriately and all things that chip away at our general theme of thankfulness in our lives. But I actually think we're called to be a deeply thankful person and take nothing for granted. I always go through life, as far as possible, expecting not a lot. And then when something happens, I think, ooh, how that was really lovely. The least you expect, the happier you are when good things happen. And now I know there are things that get through the old defences, but be thankful. Do thankful things. Many times I've done pastoral crisis, you know, relational breakdowns things, where people have come and said, my husband's a psycho nutter and he's driving me up the wall and leaves a pansy up and when he cooks dinner food goes everywhere including from the kitchen into the lounge and and you know he's always late and he says he's going to be home at 6 and then he turns up at 8 and everything's winding me up and I hate him or it could be the other way around you know it could be my, my wife never pay, never laughs at my jokes it's quite normal fellas didn't laugh at my jokes and he's wound up and oh, marriage is so hard Do you know what the answer is, actually? I always say to people, find that thing you can give thanks for. It's a great way through. Find the thing you can give thanks for. I reckon the Lord, looking on us, probably ain't got a lot to be thankful for sometimes, but he loves us. Still went to the cross for us. And that first little step through is what makes all the difference. Live a thankful life. It's very healing, actually. I've seen marriages rescued by being thankful. I've actually seen healing by being thankful. I have. I've seen people come through some quite chronic conditions by changing the orientation of their lives and going from being really down there, not in every case, but in some, where it's actually been... Like their horizons have been just looking at the floor and everything that's miserable. And it's not been through a medical thing, it's just been the orientation of their heart. And actually you start to be thankful and it lifts you. And I've seen people with all sorts of fatigue and all sorts of stuff healed over time actually for just changing the way they see things. And sometimes, just to be practical here, we are so stressed out and tired, you just need to take a break and and just get your head back. Just get a bit of peace. Take a bit of holiday. Stop doing stuff. Just get your perspective right. But be a thankful person. Lead a thankful life. It's a very healing thing. Secondly, very briefly, I think because we know that God is our provider, I think we should be amongst the most generous people on the planet as well, as far as is practically possible. And I don't just mean financially. I mean living sacrificially. You know, we often talk about hospitality as Christians, but I don't think hospitality means just having a soiree every now and again with some fine Malbec and a bowl of olives. Why did I say that? Probably because of what I like. I don't think it necessarily means that. I think it means being prepared to be inconvenienced. 
truly opening your homes. I remember in a church that I led, when we had a, a house that effectively had two and a half bedrooms, and we needed, we had a youth intern starting from a out, year out program. Now there were lots of people living where we lived with very large houses, but no one offered to put this person up. And I thought, I think we gotta do this to model something, to pave the way. So actually we shoved Emily and Annie into a cupboard for a year in the, in cot, so you couldn't open the door properly, <laughs> <You're> like clunk, <laughs> you know, just squeeze in. Hello children. <laughs> like this, it was, it was literally like that. And um there's other stories around it. And then and then the intern person moved in, we made we did the to the big bedroom. And then I remember saying, My my home is your home. You know, anything you want, you just make yourself at home. Two things happened very quickly. One was I had a delivery from the Sunday Times Wine Club. And then I went with 12 bottles of wine and I went away. I think someone gifted it to me actually. Then I went away for a week and we Karen and I came back, no wine. And I said, where's all the wine gone? He said, you said my home's your home and helped myself do anything. I went to a party and took the box of wine. I thought, you stupid child. <laughs> when I said my home's your home, I, I didn't mean the Malbec. Or the rocker, the reserver. Stupid. <laughs> anyway, I thought actually, actually maybe this is what it is to to open your home and your life up. Well, it's good for you, isn't it? Apart from then, when she met a young man in the church and they started to date, and I came in for needing a church meeting, Karen and I, and we walked into the lounge and there they were sitting romantically in dim light, holding hands, quite an appropriate young Christian relationship. Nothing untoward was happening. But as I walked in, she said, are you intending on coming into the lounge? I went, possibly. She went, not for long, no. I went, what? I said, well, we're in here. And I remember I walked out the lounge and thought, stupid God, I just want to kick you out of my home forever. But actually, it was a real test of my heart. I mean, we did have a conversation about the wine and the, and the use of the living room for the rest of my family over time. But actually, being generous means being inconvenienced. It means giving freely. I think it means lending without expecting stuff back. And Jesus gave to us so freely. And not keeping a record of wrongs, having a generous heart towards people, being gracious, looking for the good, forgiving quickly, just moving on, just don't carry stuff. It's a very healing thing. That's how Jesus treats you. That's how the ultimate provider treated you. Forgives you very quickly. Went to the cross, not just for all the things you did, but all the things you're going to go on to do. Wow, that's a thing, isn't it? Forgives you for all the things you're going to go on to do. I think it means overlooking insults and pain and problems. I've probably told you this before, but very briefly once. It always happens when I'm on the road, which is a lot. But once Karen sent me a message saying that our neighbour had gone off the deep end when we lived in Somerset, um, complaining viciously and angrily into Karen's face about apparently a building that we were constructing in our garden that overlooked his fence garden. But actually it wasn't. It was a frame for some roses that was just propped up against the fence while we hadn't finished doing it. And, uh, but apparently it got right in Karen's face, didn't he? It was very angry. An angry, grumpy sort of chap. And... Um, that's a bit of a button for me. You know, you can have a go at me, but don't have a go at me missus, you know what I mean? I go a bit all Guy Ritchie gangster movie. You know, when you have a go at me wife, I get a little bit frustrated about that. Get a little bit, you know, a little bit annoyed. And all the way home, I was away for two days and it was stewing. I tried to listen to me worship music, but I put some heavy metal on instead. I was building up my anger. I was ready for a fight. I was. I parked up and I dumped my bags in. I'm going okay, straight round. It had been brewing for two days. I was up for it. You know, I think God's given me a gift of the gab. I'm going to destroy this man with my eloquence and words. <laughs> Just to touch my wife. Anyway, as I walked out the door, I felt the Holy Spirit saying, Well, that's not very really good, is it? It's not a good attitude. It is. Perfectly acceptable. 
I thought the Lord said to me, well, I've forgiven you. Well, you know, what are you going to do? So I grabbed a Mr. Kipling cake, went round there and had a chat. Knocked on the door and he was straight at the door he was. <coughs> I went, hello. <laughs> Come to talk to you about the incident with, with Karen. Would you like a cake and a cup of tea? He went, What? I said, would you like a cake and a cup of tea? He said, I think it'd be really good to chat this through. He went, what do you mean? And I just went, are you okay? How is life at the moment? And he went, oh, it's terrible. Everything's going wrong. <laughs> My wife's in hospital. And I've got this leg problem. I went, let's, let's have a cup of tea and a, a bit of cake then. And I've since found, since that day, that Mr. Kipling pink fondant fancies are a great <laughs> rescue strategy for most times of stress. But actually, it was, it was, I had to get a grip on myself. You have your first reaction, don't you? That's in your flesh. But at the second reaction, when you calm down, be in the spirit. That's what I've tried to learn over the years. I don't always get it right. I really don't. Uh, but I'm just thinking in response to God's provision for us in Christ, there may be... We should be living generous, grace-filled lives. And finally, I would say, let's enlarge our faith. In response to the provision of God in all things, let's have a big faith for what God's going to do here and in our lives. And let's not limit his horizons. He died for a purpose, and that's to rescue as many people as possible. Let's have big faith for that. And I think, let's, if we seek first the kingdom, all these other things will happen. If we can get our characters right, our hearts right, we have big faith, big-hearted people, Trusting God, full on for Jesus, keeping our lives in perspective, Christ-centered, Jehovah Jireh. And I think God will bless us in immensely powerful and incredible, awe-inspiring ways, actually. I, I really do. But let's put no limits on his grace and no limits on his provision, no limits on what he can do. Isn't it amazing? You look at that Genesis 22 account and 2,091 years later, Jesus was carrying his cross as Isaac carried a pile of wood to a place of sacrifice and then we are living in the afterflow of that now isn't that amazing 2,000 years on from that give or take the odd decade we're living in the afterflow of that amazing provision of Christ something we should all be thankful for